All right, everyone. So this is chapter 16. So this is on temperature and the kinetic theory of gases. So in this chapter, we're going to be learning about uh, temperature, temperature scales, and internal energy. Uh, so in this next few chapters, uh, we are learning about uh, a branch of physics called thermodynamics, which means then uh, the energy that we are considering generally going to be going into the changing the temperature of the object. So that's why understanding what a, what a temperature is, how to define temperature scientifically, and uh, what are, you know, what the temperature, let's say, depends on or proportional to and things like that. So all of those things are what we're going to be studying in this chapter and continuing with the with the next chapter. So uh, that means we're going to talk about, let's say, energy transfer between a system and its environment. But generally, that energy transfer that we are talking about, it's not technically the work done like we used to. It is in terms of then um, energy that goes into changing the temperature rather than, let's say, kinetic energy and things like that. So uh, we will be able to combine them together in the next chapter. But for this particular chapter, we are looking at in terms of energy, uh, let's say understanding what the energy is and how we can represent energy of a system. All right, so uh, we're gonna look at in terms of the resulting variation in temperature and changes in state. We're gonna talk about ideal gas law and how we can relate things like pressure, volume, temperature, number of particles and things like that. All right, so in this, again, in this chapter, right, we are talking about this temperature as a, uh, a quantity that is not very easy to define because, you know, when you talk about temperature is something like hotness and coldness, right? Something that is hot or something that is cold, um, but mostly like how it feels. Because if you have, uh, I don't know, for example, two objects like an ice cube and I don't know, like a toy, Obviously, then what you have here is the ice cube going to be uh, colder than some toy, right? So like, let's say, I don't know, your phone, let's say, or whatever. So that means you're holding in one hand the ice cube, the other hand is a toy or the phone, then you're going to have a different temperature. But then, of course, like, let's say those are just relative to one another. If you have uh, replaced ice cube with uh, some kind of hotter object, right, then uh, toy, the, the phone or the toy that you're holding now is going to be the colder object compared to something that is much hotter than, let's say, um, I don't know, let's say your your uh, your phone, for example. That means um, this term hot or cold is kind of like a relative, unless we uh, kind of you know use some kind of reference scale where we can measure the temperature of an object and then base it on some kind of you know uh, empirical measurement. And that's sort of what we're going to be doing. We're going to be looking at how we can um, set up a scale for the temperature. Uh, and um, there are uh, you know, three scales that we're gonna be looking at. And then there are devices that can measure and give us that particular uh, temperature change or temperature at the you know, particular you know, uh, time and instant and position, right? Uh, from this you know, uh, devices like thermometers and things like that. All right. so. You can see that in terms of uh, temperature, right? So again, so hotness and coldness and things like that. We also have uh, other more fundamental, uh, let's say laws of physics involved in terms of uh, looking at how, you know, object temperature, right? It's hotness or coldness can change. And it usually changes when the object interacts with uh, environment uh, or with another object. So when you have two objects, at a different temperature. So let's say here's object one, and then let's say you put it in contact with object two and there's a physical contact between them. If the temperature of object one initially is not the same as the temperature of object two initially, right? So, but you're putting them in, in thermal contact, that means physically, you know, putting them together, then there's gonna be an exchange of energy. Okay, so this is obviously a different type of exchange of energy that we have seen before. Because you know neither neither of them moving or changing shape or changing height and things like that, uh, but there is an energy you know exchange, and that energy exchange due to the fact that their temperatures are not the same. And as long as their temperature not the same, this energy transfer gonna happen between them until they eventually reach same final temperature. 
Once they reach the same final temperature, then we can say the system that involves those two objects together is then in thermal equilibrium. Thermal equilibrium means that there will be no longer any energy exchange. Energy exchange was due to the fact that they had a different temperature, but now because of this, you know, thermal equilibrium, they both have the same temperature, so there will be no energy exchange. Okay, so uh, so technically this doesn't have to be physical contact, as I said, right? So that's a physical contact is probably easier to, to visualize it. Um, so, but you know, that's kind of like you can think of like for example uh, another example of physical contact. You take a glass of water, put an ice cube in it, right? And obviously then there's exchange of energy between them where the water was warmer and then ice cube was colder because of their different temperatures, they're gonna be energy exchange. And this energy exchange uh, will go into always like exactly in the same direction. It will go from hotter object to a colder object. So that's one of the things we're gonna see that's actually one of the laws of thermodynamics the direction of the energy, uh, let's say transfer. So, so that's kind of like what we're gonna be talking about in this next few chapters. All right, again, so kind of like summarize it here. So you have two objects, object A and object B. And um, if they are, let's say, to start with, right, had different temperatures, you can uh, put them in contact until they reach the same temperature or if they're already in the same temperature and put them together, then you're gonna have no energy exchange between them. Uh, so no energy will flow from one to another because they are exactly at the same temperature. Energy only flows from one object to another um, if there is change in temperature, if there's a difference in temperature. All right, so this is generally known as a zeroth law of thermodynamics. So the zeroth law So the zero law basically describes what thermal equilibrium is. That means two objects uh, put together, you know, uh, let's say generally it goes like this. So you have three objects, I have object A, B, and C. So for example, let's say then if you have object A is in thermal equilibrium with object C and object B is in thermal, thermal equilibrium with object C, then object A and B will also be in thermal equilibrium with respect to one another. So that in this case, you can take object C to be the thermometer, right? So if those two are in equal thermal equilibrium and these two are in thermal equilibrium with respect to one another, then A and B have to be also in the thermal equilibrium with respect to one another, okay? And the question, why is it the zeroth law? Well, because when they discovered this fundamental law of nature, then they already had you know, the, the, the first law of thermodynamics and they had the second law of thermodynamics. So they didn't really wanna shift the orders. So they just basically, because it's more fundamental than the first and the second law, they just, you know, uh, call this a zero law. So I guess like a little bit easier solution uh, rather than moving everything, you know, uh, in order. Um, all right, so let's look at then what a temperature is. You can think of like temperature can be thought of as a property that determines whether an object is in thermal equilibrium with other objects. That means, you know, uh, in terms of when you're measuring the, you know, using the thermometer, right, to measure the room temperature, what you're doing here is eventually you allow your thermometer to reach thermal equilibrium with the, you know, room, you know, let's say air molecules and things like that in the room. And if then the, let's say, thermal equilibrium is achieved, so then the temperature of your thermometer no longer changes. So then you can look at it and say, okay, so the my thermometer is in equilibrium with the room or air molecules, we can call that environment if you want. But then you can say that it, you know, in thermal equilibrium with the environment, that means the temperature of my thermometer right now matches the temp temperature of the environment, which is the room temperature. So then we can say, okay, so this is the room temperature because the thermometer is in thermal equilibrium with, you know, air molecules in the room. All right, so again, two objects in thermal equilibrium with each other are exactly at the same temperature, okay? And as you know, there will be again, uh, let's say if you take this, you know, thermometer and go outside, then you will see then thermometer, you know, temp, you know, let's say uh, changes, right? It's, it's reading. That's because now thermometer is in an environment where the temperature is different. So let's say if you go outside and it's outside is summer, 
then your thermometer is basically now is the coolest object compared to let's say air molecules outside, then the temperature of the thermometer will increase until it, you know, in thermal equilibrium with uh, uh, air molecules outside of the, you know, house. But if let's say it's winter outside, then your thermometer will be the warmer object, then its temperature will go down until it matches, you know, again, thermal equilibrium with the molecules outside, you know, if it's winter. That's kind of like the, <clears throat> what we can, you know, assume in terms of, um, what this temperature and thermal equilibrium represents. All right, so the thermometers are actually, you know, uh, as I mentioned, right? So those are devices that we can measure, we can use to measure the temperature of a system. And there are a number of, you know, thermometers we can use. There are a number of things we can do to measure the temperature. You can see that there, I gave you several examples. And again, the thermometer is something that, you know, uh, you probably have used mostly either, either digital or, you know, uh, the one that has, you know, uh, mercury inside. But you know, it's usually it's a, it's a device that can, you know, show one way or another, right? The change or variation in uh, in temperature by either having a, a, a let's say a fluid inside, let's say uh, expanding or contracting, or if it's digital, right? It basically uses you know a little bit of electrical resistance in a conductor and things like that. But again, so it requires some kind of physical property of the thermometer to change physical power of thermometer to change that uh, the you know and this change is proportional to the you know the temperature you know variation so some of the part you know, properties that you can make the thermometer of and then have that change is for example the volume of a liquid or the length of a solid pressure of a gas at the constant volume volume of a gas at a constant pressure and you can also have a electric resistance of a conductor or the color of an object right that's also an indication can be for um, changing, let's say, uh, temperature. And, you know, then we can have a thermometer basically based on, you know, either combination or, you know, or one of these, let's say, options. And also then we have, you know, this scales, right, uh, where we can then use some of these type of properties, right, in the thermometers and things like that to represent, uh, let's say, specific type of, um, let's say, temperature. Because you can have a thermometer based on Fahrenheit scale of temperature or based on Celsius, or it can be based on, you know, uh, what we call Kelvin scale. So we're gonna look at all of those three scales, compare them and see what, uh, you know, let's say uh, reference points or positions are for each scale are. All right, so um, you can see that the thermometer can be calibrated by placing it in contact with some environments that remain at constant temperature. So the common system involves water, okay. So the water is the, you know, more abundant substance on earth. So we basically have most of the, um, or at least, you know, uh, not all of them, but most of the um, scales based on that. So for example, uh, a mixture of ice and water at atmospheric pressure uh, and called the ice point or freezing point of water. So the mixture of water and steam in equilibrium called a steam point, a boiling point of water. That means, you know, we can have a water to be sort of like a reference specimen in our, you know, our thermometers. So, and the Celsius scale and Fahrenheit scale basically does exactly that. So we have the, both of those represent using the, you know, a water as a, you know, let's say a reference substance and using the, them, them as, a, as a, you know, a reference positions or reference temperature. So uh, for example, the Celsius scale takes the zero uh, to be exactly the uh, freezing point or the melting point of um, let's say uh, ice and water, right? So basically the, 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 the liquid water, right? A combination. Um, so the zero for the uh, Celsius scale is that. So ice point of water is defined to be zero degrees Celsius which is a mixture of, let's say, the, the ice and liquid water. And then the point where the water, basically liquid water, you know, is mixed with the steam, right? Basically starts boiling, that basically becomes hundred degrees Celsius, okay? So, and that particular, you know, this is the Celsius scale, right? So this is also known as a centrigate because there's a, you know, equal, you know, let's say parts, right? So it's from zero to 100 and you can break it down into like 10 equal parts. Um, Fahrenheit scale is also, you know, based on water. 
it's a little bit different because it's based on um, uh, water, like liquid water, ice, and salt combination. So, it, it, like let's say, equal mix of the uh, of those things, three things together, and that was defined as the zero of the Fahrenheit. But then the let's say the thirty-two degree of Fahrenheit is defined as just a mixture of you know equal mixture of uh, water and uh, and ice. So not not including salt anymore. So and that that's why the thirty-two degree Fahrenheit is equivalent to the zero degree Celsius. Uh, because they both represent mixture of, um, let's say, water, liquid water, and uh, ice water, or you can say that uh, water in its solid and a liquid state. All right, so then you can do the length of the column between these two points divided into 100 equal segments called degrees. So this is, uh, again, mostly in terms of the Celsius scale, right, from zero and to 100. All right, so the thermometer is colored by using an ice water bath and a system of <clears throat> water bath, as I mentioned. So, and also the pressures of the mercury uh, under each situation are recorded. So the volume is kept constant by adjusting. Um, uh, all right, so where there's then this A over here is uh, some kind of, let's say a specific type of, uh, you know, a level for the, for the mercury. All right, so then what we can we, what we can do here is we can then look at in terms of the pressure. So let's say this is initial pressure, this is then final pressure, and how the pressure changes, right? Uh, let's say when the temperature changes. So this is you know important actually relationship which we're gonna uh, see uh, later on again. So there's a pressure you know decrease where then the temperature decreases. So this is important to see that the pressure is directly proportional to the, to the, to the temperature. There's a direct proportionality. That means if the increase, if you increase the temperature, pressure increases. If you decrease temperature, pressure is decreases. Okay, and that relationship was very important um, at the end to get a little more accurate scale, because one, when, when we look at again this, uh, let's say the scale for the Celsius or the scale for the Fahrenheit. They both use the, uh, let's say, a water, some kind of combination of water or ice or you know salt, right, to to get their you know reference position. But uh, obviously, let's say if you have some kind of different substance, then zero degree is not where it melts or where it you know freezes, right? So for example, you take aluminum. Aluminum is a solid at zero degree. You know, it's basically solid at hundred degrees, right? So you don't really have. Um, uh, let's say that scale of presenting, you know, all the substances, you know, accurately. It's mostly like, let's say in terms of that scale based on water. Now, one of the things we can also see here is um, if we use this, let's say, um, a thermometer readings, right, for the, you know, different substances. So let's say here's a trial one, which is a one type of substance. Here's a trial two, another subtype of substance. Trial three, you know, third type of substance. That means, you know, one may be like aluminum, the other one may be water, the third one, I don't know, let's say uh, hydrogen or something like that, right? So three different substances. And we can see how the pressure for all of them, right, decreases with decreasing temperature, but it, it happens differently, right? So each one has a in different initial pressure, different final pressure. Let's say when you go from 200 to zero, each one has a different even uh, steepness for the, for the graph. That means they change differently. But one important thing was observed is that if we continue decreasing the temperature for all those three substances, then they all actually reach, you know, reach zero pressure at one specific temperature, regardless of what type of substance we have. And that temperature is negative 273.15 degrees Celsius. That means regardless of what type of substance we have, if you take then that substance and uh, measure the pressure change or pre pressure variation with the you know change in, in temperature, you will you know you will get exactly same you know uh, temperature final temperature when the pressure you know lowered all the way to zero, and this is known then absolute zero, because at this temperature, every single substance basically uh, has zero pressure and the zero pressure what, what do we mean by zero pressure? So we learn about um, how to define a pressure in chapter 15, where let's say if you have a container with uh, molecules, right? 
So it doesn't matter if it's you know solid, liquid, or gas, those molecules collide with the wall of the container and then uh, basically there's a pressure. And then one thing we can say here is that at this particular temperature, the molecules of any substance, liquid, gas, or, or solid, uh, have no pressure, which means that they basically have no motion at all to collide with each other, all with the container wall. So that's why it's called the absolute zero, indicating that you know there is you know a temperature where you know absolutely no pressure, absolutely no motion of any type of uh, particle, of any type of you know a specimen that we can consider. All right. So again, this was an important discovery, and um, also one of the things that you know let's say we can talk about here is that. Probably, you know, this is, you know, a more going to be a, a more appropriate scale for uh, temperature because, let's say, instead of taking a zero to be in terms of some kind of water or, you know, let's say water, ice, you know, salt mix, right, for the Fahrenheit, for example, uh, maybe it's, it's better just to take this as a zero scale, and that's what exactly is done by, uh, you know, uh, uh, Lord Kelvin. So that's, you know, we can see that. Kelvin scale is basically based on this fact. So he discovered that this temperature, negative 273.15 degrees Celsius, is a, it's absolute zero for every substance. So might as well take this to be a zero for a new scale that represents basically just a zero. And after that, everything increases. There is no negative for the, we're gonna see for this Kelvin scale. All right, again, so the absolute zero is used as the basis of the absolute temperature scale. Okay, the size of the degrees on the absolute scale is the same as the size of the degrees on Celsius scale. That means one of the things we're going to see here is, so this is the new scale, right? So uh, let's say known as the absolute temperature scale, or we call it like Kelvin scale. Okay, so then what we have here is the zero Kelvin is then this absolute zero. And then the way that Kelvin scale increases so let's say you go from one temperature to another and like, let's look at this delta T in terms of Kelvin. It's also gonna be exactly same, you know, let's say change in you know, temperature for the Celsius scale. That means if you change your Kelvin scale by 10 Kelvin, right? It's also change in 10 degrees Celsius, but it is not the same in terms of uh, changing temperature in Fahrenheit. So Fahrenheit does not have the same, you know, uh, let's say, um, size, in, in change in size. That means 10 degrees change, delta T, I'm talking about specifically delta T, 10 degree delta T in Celsius is equal to 10 Kelvin change, but not equal to 10 Fahrenheit change. All right, so then we have a scale that allows us to go from <clears throat> Celsius, I would like to put a K over here, so we know it's a Kelvin scale. So that means temperature in Celsius equals temperature in Kelvin minus 273. That's why when Kelvin scale is zero, then you get that temperature scale of zero Kelvin as uh, 273.15, right? So then you can say that that's basically the temperature for the Celsius scale equivalent to the zero degree as uh, zero Kelvin. We usually don't say degree Kelvin, we just say Kelvin. All right, so um, again, so that absolute temperature scale is now based on two new fixed points. One point is absolute zero, the other one is a triple point of water. So this is the combination of temperature and pressure where ice, water, and steam can all coexist. That's ice, you know, that's something we're gonna look at in the next chapter. So it's called a triple point of water. Okay. Now, um, triple point of water occurs at 0 0.01 degrees Celsius and at 4.58 millimeter of mercury. So this temperature was set to be 273.16 on the absolute temperature scale. Okay, so this made the old absolute scale agree closely with the new one. And the units of this, I guess, as I mentioned, right, are Kelvin. So the absolute scale is also called the Kelvin scale and named after uh, William Thompson, who also called himself Lord Kelvin. Okay, it was Lord because he was a Scottish physicist who got knighted by the Queen of England, so he was technically lower. All right, so the triple point temperature is 273.16 Kelvin. Uh, no degree, again, no degree symbol is used for the Kelvin, just, you know, uh, a number and a Kelvin, where for the Celsius and Fahrenheit, we do use a degree to represent that. All right, 
So here's then uh, a scale, right? So you can see this is in Kelvin uh, and kind of gives you more or less some of the, you know, you don't have to memorize any of this, but some, you know, interesting facts about uh, temperature in Kelvin. So um, this is taken to be like a zero Kelvin. So the lowest temperature achieved is 10 to the negative nine Kelvin. But, you know, I'm not sure, let's say if this is right now the, the most updated, you know, lowest temperature, but let's say uh, it's a billionth of a Kelvin, right? So uh, that was, you know, what was, what, what you know, uh, maybe like, let's say a few years back, right? As the lowest temperature. Um, liquid helium is roughly, you know, maybe like two or three degree, as uh, two or three Kelvin, okay? Uh, and then liquid hydrogen is roughly maybe 12 Kelvin, 15 Kelvin. As you can see, right, liquid helium, which means that, you know, at this temperature, it goes from uh, solid to liquid. And then what we have here is, for example, you, have, you get uh, liquid nitrogen. This is 10 to the two, which is a 100, uh, you know, uh, let's say 100, and this is about 273, where then the water freezes. Um, or like, let's say boiling, uh, the, the, the melting point or the freezing point. Uh, 10 to the three Kelvin, which is, you know, uh, 1000 Kelvin, that's copper melts. So this is the, you know, the surface of the sun, which is um, uh, roughly about uh, uh, 5000 5, Kelvin. Um, and then, you know, the solar corona, which is the uh, little, little bit above the solar, you know, the, let's say solar atmosphere, the, the temperature is actually much hotter than at the surface. Uh, the interior of the sun is even, even hotter, right? It's, it's, it's basically um, roughly 10 million Kelvin. And then hydrogen bomb is like, let's say 100 million Kelvin and so on and so forth. So those are basically some of the, uh, let's say, I guess, you know, like uh, the facts, right? Of the Kelvin scale. Again, you don't have to memorize any of those things. Maybe the water freezes. That's one thing that you guys uh, need to know. All right, so um, Fahrenheit scale is gonna be used very rarely in this class. I don't really use it too much unless it's, you, you know, you, you're given everything in terms of Fahrenheit then you need to convert. So let's say, how do you go from Fahrenheit to Celsius or Celsius to Fahrenheit? Well, those are the conversion, let's say, that are given to you. So um, temperature of ice point is 32 degree Fahrenheit where ice, you know, melts into liquid water or liquid water freezes into ice. So this is then the boiling point where, you know, you go from steam, uh, liquid to steam or, you know, steam, you know, back to liquid. Uh, and there you can see right 180 divisions uh, or degrees. And here's a conversion factor, where it's nine over five temperature in Celsius plus 32. So that will give you temperature in Fahrenheit. And as I mentioned, the temperature change in Fahrenheit and Celsius are not the same. So there's a factor of nine over five in terms of looking at the you know, delta TC compared to delta TF, where delta T Kelvin is exactly equal to the delta T Celsius. Okay, so that's kind of like the conversion factor. You can pretty much use the same conversion factor for the, uh, for the Kelvin as well, Kelvin and Fahrenheit. Okay, now, now that we know, let's say about the temperature scales and things like that, we can start using then uh, those quantities in uh, some applications. And one application here is when you have, um, let's say an object like a concrete or, uh, or conducting metals and things like that, they can actually change their shape when the temperature increases. So when you have temperature increase on, you know, let's say during the summer or temperature decrease during the winter, then some things like concrete or the, the, the metals that are used to connect, you know, the bridge, bridge pieces or buildings and things like that can actually change their, you know, length a little bit. So, and this is known as a thermal expansion. Okay, so this is just a tiny change, but things like this, if you, if you, you know, building this, for example, and if you have everything just connecting like, like this, right? One and the other one. So let's say, you know, those pieces like this, right? So, uh, or maybe like, let's say if it's a railroad, right? You can, you can have like a pieces like this. So if, if they're physically like, you know, hitting each other, touching each other, right? Pushing on each other uh, during the spring, for example, then during the summer, they're gonna be expanding even further. 
So they can again then push each other even further because they're going to be expanding. But if there's absolutely no room for them to expand, then they can kind of push on each other and deform or basically break and things like that. So that's why if you can see right, there's a little bit of gap. There's a little bit of gap and that gap then is specifically there so that when the, you know, the metals expand, they have room to expand. Same thing with, uh, uh, let's say concrete, right? So the concrete also, you know, uh, you, you probably have seen that sometimes, you know, that when the concrete breaks uh, during the summer and things like that. So there's a point over there. But so generally, you know, the engineers have to take that into account and create a little bit of gaps uh, so that there is a room for the expansion. All right, so, so this, is, this is basically the, the thermal expansion, right? There's a consequence, this thermal expansion consequence of the change in the average separation between the atoms in the object, okay? So you can think of like, let's say in a solid object, right? In an object in a solid state, the molecules are connected to each other. So like with this spring-like, you know, uh, molecular bond. Those are actually not springs, but spring is basically represents that force between them, this molecular forces between them. And the forces are strong. So you can think of like, let's say there's a kind of like a spring type forces because it's more or less spring type forces perfectly describe this type of intermolecular forces because molecules can't really move too far from one another because then the spring will pull it back, but they can vibrate a little bit. So there's a vibration so that the, they just basically jiggle a little bit, you know, back and forth. And the spring system allows them to, to vibrate a little bit. So things like this, when the temperature increases, then these molecules can vibrate with a little bit more energy because, you know, when it increases, the temperature increases and, uh, you know, our environment has a higher temperature than the object, then, in, you know, object gains some of the energy, right? There's thermal, thermal exchange. So as these molecules gain energy, they start, you know, gaining some kinetic energy and moving, you know, vibrating or moving a little bit further back and forth. Okay, and this little further back and forth motion then allows then the object itself expand a little bit. Okay, so that means, you know, this little of jiggle, little of vibration of the molecules with increasing temperature, you know, becomes a little more violent, right? And, you know, it overall, the object itself is basically uh, expands a little bit. And we can calculate that uh, delta L, which is the, you know, the length of the expansion or contraction, because if it becomes cold, then, you know, those molecules lose energy, then they vibrate, uh, you know, with less intensity. So they get closer to one another. And, uh, you know, the, let's say the metal rod or something like that, for example, actually shrinks. So then taking this to be uh, L initial, which is the initial length of some kind of metal rod, so then one thing we can see here is it, it can change, let's say its length either by, you know, ex expanding or, you know, shrinking, right? A little bit. So then this, this is, let's say, represent this change in length, okay? And this change in length is proportional to the original length. And it's also proportional to the change in temperature by how much the temperature, you know, is, you know, let's say uh, different from before. So then this Delta L, is proportional to the initial initial length and the change in temperature. And then this alpha here is the proportionality constant. Because remember, on the left side, you have meters. On the right side, you have meters. But then also, let's say, degrees Celsius, for example. Well, you can't have meters on one side, degree Celsius, meters times degrees Celsius on the other side. So the alpha has then units of one degree Celsius. So they can cancel each other. And then you have the same as length. Okay. So the alpha is the average coefficient of linear expansion, okay? The units are one per, you know, one per degree Celsius or technically it can be Kelvin to the negative one because you can represent this Delta T also in terms of Kelvin, okay? So, but because it's Delta T, they're equivalent. You don't have to convert back and forth. So Delta T, let's say if temperature is 20 degrees Celsius variation, right? You go from 20 degrees Celsius to 40 degrees Celsius. It's also equivalent to the 20, Kelvin variation. So that's why you can just leave it, you know, in terms of Kelvin or Celsius. But this, you know, equation again represents the linear uh, thermal expansion, right? So it's linear because it's one dimensional. That means it only expands either, you know, if it's horizontal bar, it expands horizontal. If it's a vertical bar, it expands vertically. So that means it's expansion in just one specific direction. 
but you can also have expansion that is uh, along every direction. So you can have an expansion that uh, only you know expands the area of the object. That means it's a two-dimensional expansion. Or you can have a three-dimensional expansion, which is in terms of then the entire volume of the object can you know can change. And you can see right. So for example, as the washer is heated, so here's an example of a washer with the radius A and you know inner radius A, outer radius B, and initial temperature Ti. When the temperature increases, everything basically expands. That means A becomes bigger, A plus delta A. B becomes bigger, B plus delta B. And the temperature as increases, right? So the entire washer basically expands in, including the inner radius and outer radiuses. So, so this one then you can also have to look at it in terms of this. So uh, there's uh, two more types of expansion. One is the volume expansion, delta V, which is equals to the initial volume times change in temperature, then times coefficient of volume expansion. And then you can also have an area, average coefficient of the area expansion when the area changes. So think like this, this is three-dimensional, this is two-dimensional, right? So that means, you know, you have something like this and it just basically, you know, increases, expands, right? So then um, this is three-dimensional, for the volume expansion, area expansion is two-dimensional. It's given as gamma times original area times delta T. An interesting thing here is, remember, alpha is a one-dimensional increase in length, and gamma is two-dimensional. So it actually goes two times alpha in terms of coefficient, because you know the alpha is like let's say it's x, gamma is x and y. So you know two times that, and beta is x, y, and z. So then three times the alpha. So this is in terms of the coefficient. So if I give you coefficient of linear expansion, you can then use that to find the, you know, the area expansion and volume expansion coefficients from that. But there's a, you know, a table with mostly, you know, alpha and beta, but, you know, you can see, right? So for, for example, aluminum, it's 2.4 times 10 to the negative five. Well, three times that, well, it's roughly 7.2, right? So it's 7.2 times 10 to the negative five. Brass is two, Brass here is three times more, so which is six, and so on and so forth. So you can see, right? All I need to do technically to give you alpha, and to you know the the alpha here, uh, let's say gamma here is two times alpha, and beta here is then three times alpha. Then we can calculate from that. All right. So let's look at an example here. So um, you have a length of a steel beam increases increases by 0.73 millimeters. What is, what, when it's temperature, so when its temperature is raised from 22 degrees Celsius to 35 degrees Celsius. Then the question will be in terms of, um, what is the length of the beam at 22 degrees Celsius? What was the original length of the beam? All right, so using this equation, so assuming that let's say this is the beam, okay? And now it expands a little bit and this, we're given this delta L, 0.73, millimeters so it's not by much but still it's it's a, a significant because it's only about uh you know uh, 13 degrees celsius increase you can have much higher increase in temperature so we need to convert this to meters so times 10 to the negative three meters and we're given that initial temperature is 22 degrees celsius then the final temperature is 35 degrees celsius and the equation that we have here is this delta l is equals to alpha times L initial, then times delta T. And what we want to find is L initial, right? What is the length of the beam, original length of the beam, which will then delta L, then divided by coefficient of you know, uh, linear expansion, then times delta T. All right, so then this is uh, 0.73 times 10 to the negative three meters divided by, then for alpha, since we are told this is steel beam, we can go back Sorry, you can go back and look at in terms of steel. This is 1.2 times 10 to the negative five. So it's 1.2 times 10 to the negative five, then times delta T, which is 35 degree Celsius minus 22 degrees Celsius. And we can calculate length, original length of the, of the beam. All right, plug in everything. This should give us 4.7 meters. And that's our answer.